So today's class is um, Humanidade, Humanity, right? So, so it, the title of this class is, it, it's, you, you pronounce that Somos Humanidade. And it's, it's Portuguese for we are humanity. And I'll tell you where, where, that, where it comes from in a, in a few minutes. But um, we're going to, it's kind of a really special class for, for me, for all of us in a certain sense. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I've been looking forward to it. And I want to go back on a couple things. If you could go, go to this next slide. I showed you this slide earlier in, in the semester. And I, I want to just remind, you know, the one thing that I really try not to do ever is to kind of motivate people or push people or manipulate people to feel guilt or feel bad or feel something, right? So, the, the, but you know, in this particular class, given the nature of the topics that we're discussing, discussing, there are, there's just a lot of stuff that, you know, that's not, I don't know, it's not, fu it's not fully uplifting, right? I mean, there, there are things, right, that in, in the world. And I mean, it is, it's all, it's all relative, right? Like, you, you know, we, we cross, everybody crosses through into the unknown and the unknown by everything, everything that I can uh, assess is pretty cool. Um, but uh, my job is not to get us to feel bad or guilty or anything like that, right? Just like it's not to get people to feel too much of themselves. But from my assessment, and I've only had 61 years on this planet, from my assessment, I feel like I've better understood the more I understand different aspects of the world and the more I understand my particular place in it, the more I understand life itself. And, and I look at this because, you know, like we, we're in a, in a period in history of unprecedented wealth and comfort and all, all the things that, you know, you, you, we just the things that are available to human beings, the, the level of comfort, right? And we're at the time in, of the human history with the, the, the lowest amount of violence. There's less violence today than any point in human history. And, and so it's hard to really comprehend all of that, right? Um, But what this graph is, if you may remember it, so the percentage of adults, 1% um, of adults control, this is all the wealth in the world. This property is just wealth. And 1% controls 46% of all the wealth. This is the world. And 1% are people with a million dollars. So you add up all your assets in a family, right? So if you know you have a family and you're, you know, they've got all your retirement accounts and houses and all that kind of stuff, and you add it all up, it's like where do you stand? And the next 11% are people who own between 100,000, who are worth 100,000 to a million, and they control this much, right? And 55% of the human population is what is called here to be miserable, own less than. $10,000, and, and many of these, a huge number of them own nothing at all. Don't think 10,000, think more like $100. And they control about 1% of all the global wealth. And it's like most of you all in this classroom, you are part of the richest 1% of the human population. Doesn't matter what your race is, doesn't matter what your background is, when you coming from the families of most of you in this classroom, you're in the richest 1%. And that's like, you line up 100 people and you're the one at the very end. You know what I mean? The one at the very end. And you, you know, and I could say, well, you know, I, I'm here at the end of that 100 people, you know, but I could be way out there, but it doesn't matter, I'm here. And when you, when you sit with that, right? It's like, oh, it's like, 
when you, you put this in perspective, you just have a way of, it, it just catalyzes a change in oneself that I don't know what it does. It's different for every, I wish I could, I wish I could just download my brain to everybody, but like, damn, man. To think that we are a room full of the 1%. And if we're not the 1%, if you're not in that, you're in the 11%. So the rich is 12%. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, God. And you certainly, if not now, you will be. It's not going to change. And there's something about the realization of that, the kind of understanding of that. It's like that, that just... It's so humbling and it's so powerful just as a way not to feel guilty, not to feel bad, not to feel whatever, but it's just a way of, of just, ah, just placing ourselves somehow. So listen, um, we're going we're to talk to a, a friend today, a friend of mine, friend of the class actually, but you know, you don't know her. I know her, but she, you will know her. But I want to just say a couple, I just thought, let me just say a few things. So, I, so my focus in, in my, all, all of my education and my early research, the early part of my life was in Latin America and, and in Africa, but primarily Latin America. And I spent a lot of time in Latin America and trying to understand poverty more than anything else. And I got really curious about the Catholic Church and Protestants and Christians and how it was that Christians can really hold just Christians, right? I'm, and I'm now currently fascinated by Muslims and obviously Buddhists and lots of other philosophies and so on. But I got really curious about how it is that Christians can hold a Christian theology in the middle of so much deprivation and poverty. I just really, I took a trip to Latin America and I saw some things that I just was like, oh my God, how, how do you make sense of this? To, to just such, on one hand, that, the, 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 it's just a misery. And on the other hand, just this wealth that I saw, not only around me, but also there in parts. And I just really wanted, so I kept going back. And I just kept going back, right? And ultimately, um, you can go, so ultimately, I wanted to study this thing called liberation theology. And it's a movement inside the, the, the Catholic Church that was focused around Catholics who reinterpreted the entire Bible and the entire message of God to be that God stands for the poorest of the poor. The church historically has stood for the rich, but we really think that God stands for the poor. And that the rich have taken over the church, like these televangelists who fly around in their jets and stuff, right? They've taken it over and they've like co-opted this messaging for wealthy people. But in fact, the vast majority of people on the earth are poor and it's a message for the poor. And this statement, this, this is a statement from a priest who I befriended, right? And I wrote this down in my notes. And I mean, this is what, all I did. I mean, what I did for years is just follow priests and nuns around. I spent so much time with priests and nuns. I learned so many, had so many utterly fascinating experiences. And I'm not Catholic, I, you know. I just wanted to know how it is that human beings can accept deprivation and poverty. And then integrate that into their mindset like know it occurs and either do something about it or don't do something about it but have it somehow in their mindset right it's like poverty is a result of rich people's greed and not just an act of birth you're like, I'm like yeah man god and these aren't priests like those of you who are catholic they priests like you know these are this is a very different group of people and so i this has been the issue or the question that's plagued me my entire life, trying to understand how to make sense of this, right? So this is a, I found these two photos over the weekend. I don't know, I just saw, that's, that's, that's me back when I was roaming the hills of, of Ecuador, um, trying to, you know, those, the Andes Mountains. I shouldn't say the hills, the mountains. And then here's another shot of me. You know, like I would go with these 
priests and we would go and visit these faraway communities, sometimes in the car, sometimes walking, sometimes on horseback. And people who had never seen a dude who looked like that. And to answer the questions, right? The questions, like, oh my God. Just wanting to know what's the purpose of all of this, right? And like, what am I supposed to do? Like, like how am I supposed to live? What do, what do I owe to the world? You know what I mean? Like, what do I owe? Like, I was in a, on a path like that one time, right? And I was with the priest. And these, this couple brought their baby who was malnourished, very poor, like really poor. I mean, at most, they ate a cup of rice a day, maybe between them. I don't know. Really poor. And they brought this baby and the baby was malnourished. And she didn't, wasn't producing milk and she was just like, ah, oh, fuck, man. And the baby died. You know, they brought the baby and said like, okay, for the priest to give the last rites, right? And the baby died right there. And I thought, you know, I could have, I could have saved that. If I would have known, like I have money in my pocket, like I could save that child. And then I could save another one and another one. At some point, like I can't anymore because I would run out of money. And like, how do I manage, how do you manage that? Like any one of you, like right now, you have, you could, e you could easily save the lives of so many people. I could put, man, I, it's very simple. It's not difficult at all, right? But what do you, what do you do? How do you do that? When do you do it? When do you not do it? You know, these are the, these are the questions. Like for me, when I was your age, these are the questions I was wrestling with. And then went out into the world to try to get answers to those questions. And I never got answers. Even to this day, I don't have an answer. I'm still wrestling, but it's, but it's like, ah, oh, God. It's like, how do I, how do you make a life? Like, how do you make sense? And then here I do what I do and what am I doing here and why are we here and what's it, what's the purpose? To the questions, the best questions in the world do not have answers. And the best questions in the world can't have answers. They're the questions that you have to ruminate on and think about and reflect on and hold deep in one's mind, soul, and heart as long as possible until you finally get tired of wrestling and that's how you get your answer. But you never get an answer. The best things in the world can't be put into words. The most important things can't be put into words, which is why when I feel like I get to the place where I'm ready to just finally say something and I can't find the words to it because anything that I have a value to say, I can't say it. That's how life is. And then when we turn around and we walk away just because, you know, for whatever reason, we got to just get on with our lives and then we don't think about it. Well, there's no answer there and then I'm just going to move on. That takes me back to my Buddhist my time in the monastery, do not squander your life. Don't squander your life. You get one shot. You get one shot. That's it. And it's real. You know, so in Islam, there's this thing called zakat. Every, every religion, every thought system, every philosophy, you got to find some way to deal with human beings around us we live in a community you got to figure out there's some way to deal with other people in the community and work with it. and they're always got to deal with figure out how to work with inequality the people the haves and the have-nots and you got to deal with poverty everybody has to deal with poverty we've got to find some way to do it you can deny it you can say oh they're always going to be that way or it is this or is that or whatever or you can take some different philosophy like these priests who said no no no, no. this isn't inevitable this is a result of greed and if we didn't have greed, then things would be very different. If you followed the teachings of Christ, we wouldn't have poverty. That's a very simple thing. But, you know, we don't follow the We manipulate the teachings of Christ in a way that makes sense so that we can mostly live the way that we can feel comfortable living. And that's how people are, unless you decide to take the journey, the road less traveled. In Islam, this thing called zakat. 
And in zakat, it's one of the five pillars of Islam to give 2.5% of your possessions and your income away to the poor. The entire religion does this. Even for some, you know, it depends on the imam and it depends on, you know, the particular interpretation, but even children, you gotta, for, for many people, even kids, you gotta figure out like what they own, what they possess and what they have and you give 2.5% away every year to the poor. So you look at your bank account and you look at all the income that you have and you add it all up and you give it away at the end of that year. And then the next year you start over. And this is the way Muslims have, they, this is the way they have this way of dealing with inequity and poverty and the haves and the have nots. And mind you, as far as I'm concerned, because I've spent a lot of time in the Muslim world, I think that there are a lot of folks who could probably do a much better job but nonetheless, this is the way that they do it. And it's like, wow, imagine that. For those of you who are not Muslim, imagine that every year you gotta calculate 2.5%, that's 1 40th of your possessions, your, in your, your income, you gotta calculate it at the end of the year. And you give it away. It's just like, there's so much we don't know. You know what I mean? Like, so much we don't know. Like, how would that be? Right? Like, like, every time, everything, 140th, everything. Two and a half cents on the dollar. I just thought I would just kick that out there because, I don't know, I, I think it's a really awesome thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>